Hello everyone and welcome to Mole Hill Mountain, episode 360. A nice round number. Get it? Of course you do. Small children get that. Um, so tonight I would like to talk about Lindy Hello. Uh, I would like to just chat about uh, some of the stuff I watched in the last week. L watched and played. In the last week or so, I did watch the um, Nintendo Direct earlier this week, and it didn't do much for me. Or just not that it was a poorly presented uh, presentation, but I just wasn't much on there that was of interest to me. However, there were some demos, and uh, I downloaded and played a couple of them. So, um, <clears throat> uh, Mario vs. Donkey Kong is a remake of a DS game, possibly 3DS, think DS, don't remember. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, I remember Mario vs. Donkey Kong. And then I watched the footage of the game, and I was like, yeah, I remember the game with the puzzles and little wind-up toys, but... That doesn't seem right to me. I played the demo and I was like, that's what it was. It was on the DS because I remember I had to like draw girders to, it was kind of like Lemmings. You actually, you didn't play as Mario, you played as the little uh, wind-up toys and you had to create paths, at, w paths in front of them to navigate them through the level. And um, I, I went to my shelf and it's a, uh, I think, like, Mario vs. Donkey Kong Mini Land Mayhem or something like that is the game that I hadn't played. But I played the demo of uh, Mario vs. Donkey Kong that's on the Switch, and it's uh, it's fine, it's cute, it's colorful. Music's actually quite nice. Um, but it, very brief. <laughs> it's, um, I think, like, four stages... It, it's very, very brief. Uh, it's a Game Boy Advance game. Okay. Yeah, I'm... Uh, I played the... In fact, I think I did the guide for... Um, the guide. A guide for... Uh, Mario Mini Mayhem... Mini Land Mayhem something. We have to go get it. Hang on. Yeah, that was right. Mini Land Mayhem... So, yeah, Mar Mario vs. Donkey Kong Mini, 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 Mini Land Mayhem uh, for the DS. Uh, fun game. Uh, I did a guide for this, and it, uh, it took forever. It was actually difficult because uh, back when this came out, um, it was earlier days of the internet where... Um, Getting screenshots and video footage off of a DS was pretty much impossible unless you wanted to record it with a handheld camera or something, which I didn't have at the time. Um, so trying to, in text, describe where to place objects in a stage to get the little wind-up toys to get where they're going was uh, quite the writing challenge. Um... So, uh, but the the new game, which is, uh, I think it was Chaos or someone who pointed out, uh, no, Lee, a remake of a Game Boy Advance game, uh, seems to be a, I mean, from what very little was displayed, it, you know, seems cute. Uh, what else did I play? I also played the Contra Operation Galuga, uh, demo, and, um, seems fine. Uh, it's... Got an expanded cast of characters. It's like, uh, if you played arcade mode anyway, you've got like five five characters to uh, choose from. Uh, huh, pirate. And um, at least the first part of the game, they, they give you two levels to play through. It mirrors the NES Contra pretty well. You start in a jungle and you go to the right. Then you fight a fortress. Um, basically a wall with gun turrets. Uh, but this time, you're surrounded because a wall with gun turrets sneaks up behind you. Somehow. <laughs> um, 
and then you and then the stage goes vertical and you have to climb up the waterfall and then you fight a another building with a kind of a monster on top of it that slaps at you and that's a I think that's where the demo ended. Um, looks pretty nice. Music's nice. Except uh, several times throughout my... The, the demo seems to be a little bit buggy because the music cut out a couple of times and just stopped. Contra is very weird when there's no music. Sound effects were still there, but the music uh, cut out a few times. No idea why. Um, the art style seems... Uh, little on the generic side, but, you know, it's, it's clear. Uh, the screen is full of explosions and crap, but the, uh, the enemy's shots, you know, the contrast is correct, so you can uh, differentiate your shots and the enemy's shots and the elements that you can actually stand on is distinct from the background elements. So, yeah, over, overall, uh, uh, and the big monster that you fight at the very top of the waterfall, I, I thought looked nice and had a nice death animation. It's it it kind of gets all goopy and, it's, and it flops over. It's pretty funny. Um, in the NES version, you hop inside the building and it does kind of a over the shoulder uh, first person, but not in the character's head. You know, over the shoulder third person kind of a thing. Uh, don't know if this new game is going to do that, but it's also, uh, implementing elements of later Contra games, uh, such as hanging from some structure, uh, climbing walls, uh, alternate fire, or, um, leveling up your, uh, alternate weapons, having some type of overload mode where you can your gun explodes and kind of smart bombs the screen depending on what weapon you have it looks like it could be fun um the problem i had with the game is um maybe it's just me being old but the game really wants you to play it with the with the analog stick and i really don't want to play it with the analog stick because i'm old and we didn't have analog sticks back when I was playing, playing Contra on the NES. <laughs> it's just weird playing it with the analog stick. I, I don't know. But it's built so that you want the aim precision of the analog stick. So, yeah, it's something you'd have to get used to. Uh, Lee says, um... It's chaos because video game logic, yeah. Lee says, uh, Paper Mario and Luigi's Mansion have finally been pre-ordered games. Oh, okay. Chicago says thanks for the heads up. Started downloading the demos and Unicorn Overlord, which is on my list to talk about. Uh, I also played the demo for Pepper Grinder, which is a uh, kind of reminds me of a couple sequences in Rayman Legends, where you uh, are digging through like cake <laughs> or sand or something like that. Uh, your character has a drill, and you just, it's not a pepper grinder, it's just a drill. I, I don't know why it's called pepper grinder, but, uh, the locomotion in the game is drilling through the ground, um, picking up speed and launching yourself out of the ground to the next patch of crap that you can drill through. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. It's, it's, uh... There are other games that have similar mechanics, but not too many. So it's a fairly unique uh, manner of locomotion. As you might guess, it's also the manner of uh, attack. Pardon me. Um, yeah, it's a retro pixely kind of a presentation, but it looks nice. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, it can get a little puzzly in uh, what order to... Um, uh, dig through certain areas to knock doors over in a certain way that allows you to progress. There's also a bunch of hidden crap. Um, so you might want to go, you know, drilling into walls and stuff. It's It's got that kind of uh, Donkey Kong Country. Start throwing barrels at all the walls to see if any of them break and there's goodies behind it kind of a thing going for it. Um, it's also got some... Uh, 
RPG very light uh, camps and shops that you can visit and spend your uh, your coins on stuff that I, I don't know what it's for because it's a demo. Uh, but overall, a uh, pleasant little game. I thought it was cute. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Cafe Fox is playing any 2D game with the analog is uncomfortable first, but like Metroid, it's something you get used to after a while. Yeah, uh, it's something that never really clicked throughout the demo, but um, uh, you can play it with the D-pad if you really, really want to, but the game is built with the expectation that you are using the um, precision aim of the analog stick, so you're you're going to want to get used to the analog stick. It works fine. I'm just old. And if I'm playing a 2D side scroller, my thumb naturally goes to the uh, to the plus pad. Uh, and then the last demo I played is uh, something uh, Chicago mentioned was a uh, Unicorn Overlord. Uh, Unicorn Overlord, uh, latest I uh, guess from uh, Vanillaware. A uh, company that has no idea what boobs look like, nor how physics affect them. Um, I guess they just don't have the internet. Like, like they're they're still they're still waiting for someone to lay the fiber optic cables in their neighborhood. <laughs> Once they get Google, yeah, they'll be like, oh, that's what they look like. That's how they move. Ah, oh, man, boy, I had it wrong the whole time guess we could have just asked somebody, but whatever. Nevertheless, Unicorn Overlord, despite its uh, name, is a um, strategy game which has some elements of, like, Fire Emblem. I haven't actually uh, completed the demo. I've played it for about two hours and uh, had to stop for the podcast. A fairly lengthy demo. Uh, it's a, a strategy game, um, strategy combat game. It, it actually reminds me quite a bit of um, Valkyria Chronicles, except not as um, 3D and immediate control where you're running around the field. Uh, this is, a again, another... On the overworld, it's a, you know kind of a retro pixel presentation. Um, more, you know, Super NES and... Um, anything older and you just move your units around and beat the snot out of other enemies but what i found particularly interesting about this game is uh the combat system is pretty unique i can't recall another game that does anything quite like this um all of your units and you have multiple units uh so you have multiple units each unit has some number of uh fighters in the unit so when one unit gets into combat with another unit, you don't actually control the flow of battle. You don't actually pick attack or heal or defend or item or block or whatever. Um, it plays out automatically. Um, so the strategy comes in where you look at what individual unit types uh you know thieves uh hunters you know uh, long range bow users uh lancers horseback riders uh shield bearers that that kind of a thing um and then you um see who's in your party and then you can uh put some in fr the, there's two rows front row and back row and you might want to put some people, you know, the magic users like should be in the back row. The thieves are weaker, but they should also be in the front row because they draw aggro, but they have really high evasion so they don't get hit too much. Um, if you're facing someone with a lance, you don't want the front row and back row characters to line up because the lancers can hit in a line. Um... Also, with all of your characters, you equip them with uh, weapons and armor, yes, but also, at some point in the game, uh, you equip them with passive and active skills So uh, that have conditions. So if certain conditions are met, they will 
uh, when the melee starts, they will uh, perform whatever active skills they have when they're attacking and whatever passive skills they have, as long as they have the points for it, when they're uh, being attacked. So their passive skills could be like blocking or putting up a shield uh, around themselves or one of their comrades. Uh, they can heal. Um, it's really neat. Oh, and the, the conditions are like, <clears throat> if health falls under 75%, then heal, else do this other skill. So it's really interesting where you're setting up the dominoes so that they all fall down in the right way once battle starts, rather than controlling the battle. Um, very interesting approach, and uh, pretty cool from what I've played. Uh, problem with the demo is it's about 25 minutes before you get to do anything. It's one of those demos where I'm sitting there going, okay, is there a game here at all, or is it just story? But to the, to the demo's credit, uh, this is a very complicated strategy game, and it's doing the thing where it doesn't appear to be starting you at the very beginning of the game where you have no units, no skills. You know, it starts you at zero and slowly adds one thing after another to build up your, your competence and your knowledge and proficiency and comfortability with the system. Uh, the demo's like, no, here's, here's everything. You just can't you can't touch much. You can see it if you want to go look at. If you want to go into the menus and browse what's there, you can. You can't do anything with it. Um, so what the game does is it it literally holds your hand for the first several encounters. It says, "Okay, click here, and then select this, and then go click over here, and we'll explain what you're doing and why." Um, so they're doing the thing where they drop you in the middle of the game where you have a lot of options, but they're also taking the time to restrict you so that you don't mess anything up and also explain what the options are and what you can do and why you would want to do them. Uh, for a complicated strategy game, pretty good demo. I'm, I'm genuinely impressed. Uh, it does look like the game is going to be very, very story heavy. But uh, aside from running around on the battlefield and uh, knocking heads with uh, the various enemies, uh, once you liberate a portion of the map, then you can run around and collect resources and go on side quests and talk to people. And uh, you get uh, rec um, reputation points, and the more reputation points you have, the more services are on offer. Uh, which can allow you to boost your army. Like uh, Fire Emblem, they've you know if you have the right characters uh, in the same unit, they'll earn bonding points or something like that. Um, you can uh, help rebuild the towns by doing little side quests and gathering materials for them. So a lot going on in the game. It's uh, and of course you know Vanillaware. They may not know what boobs look like. But they do have a very, my opinion anyway, very attractive art style, very attractive aesthetic. Um, so I was actually pretty impressed with the uh, Unicorn Overlord. Uh, still, still more demo left. But I like it so far. Don't know if I'll get it, but uh, it, it definitely surprised me. I, I, a lot of really interesting stuff in this demo. Um... <clears throat> It reminds me, there's a there was another guy. I think it was Square Enix game, Triangle, something. I don't remember what the name of the game is. Another game that I played the demo and I was like, this is kind of neat, but it's definitely not for me. Uh, Unicorn Overlord, I think, would be a, a little bit more my speed. Not sold on it yet, but uh, definitely impressed. Uh, the demo was, I found the game interesting and unique, but I also found the demo very smartly constructed as a way to uh, sell the game and not have the players be completely lost as to what the hell they're supposed to do or why. Because strategy games and RPGs notoriously difficult to demo uh, because all of the really interesting stuff, you know, the, the really cool um, mechanics that you want to show off, 
a lot of times don't show up for 20 hours. <laughs> yeah, it's like 10 to 20 hours before a lot of the really cool stuff starts to uh, to happen. So what do you do? Just let people play the first three hours of the game, the first half hour of which is just the opening cutscene and the rest of us walking around the town and talking to people and then smacking on slimes for a while. Or do you just dump them 30 hours in where you, where you have a full party and a full... Uh, a uh, full list of spells and attacks and you don't know what anything is or what's going on or who these people are or where you're going or where you've been. Very hard games to demo properly. Triangle Strategy, that's what it was called, Chicago. Thank you. So, those are the games I've um, checked out the, the demos of this week. Now, if y'all would indulge me, Right click. There we go. Not wrong click. We got a right click. Uh, I, on my Twitters, spent probably five hours Wednesday night um, writing a very lengthy and detailed Twitter thread about Rogue's butt in the animated X Men series. Um, I'm very proud of it. I'm proud of writing a thousand words around about Rogue's animated arse, and I hope you'll take the time to read it, because I thought it was really funny. So, links in the chat if you want to check it out. It's very long, but it's got pictures, and I thought it was funny. So, please enjoy, because I worked hard on it. Spent an entire evening on that stupid, <laughs> stupid thread. <laughs> you saw it? Yep. Um, all right. So I also watched, uh, some movies and TV. Actually, uh, it was, I don't think it was until like this week until I watched other than movie mandates. I hadn't watched any movies at all in February. Um, uh, pardon me. Puts the ass in assets. Yeah. I, uh, writing a Twitter thread is really difficult because it's, it's hard to organize. I mean, you could write it out longhand first and then individually copy it, but I kind of wrote it in, or, well, I got all of the media that I needed, so I knew the path that was taken. Um, but I also tried to, to use a bunch of different synonyms for butt, and I had a bunch of good ones, I thought employing some fun alliteration here and there but rereading it i i had a i had a fair number of duplicates if i had actually scripted that thing i would have you know endeavored to never use the same word for bottom twice um but i think uh, for a twitter thread it, it it turned out pretty well i i thought it was uh i thought it was fun and hey the new x-men animated series comes out um I think later next month, like March 20th or something like that. Um, and I was, uh, you know, when it came out in 1992 or three, somewhere on there. So I was 12 or 13 years old. Yeah. I watched the, uh, the X-Men animated series and, uh, quite enjoyed it. So, um, I'll definitely check out the, uh, X-Men 97, which picks up where the old one left off 30 years later. Um, the thing that kind of gives me pause, though, is um, the age demographic that the original animated series targeted, I'm no longer in. So, is X-Men 97 going to target the same age demographic that the original show did? Or is it going to target the original fans of the show? Who are now my age. I don't know. Legitimate. Which. Whichever way they go. They have gone on that. It's a perfectly legitimate way to go. But if it's still targeting. You know. 10 to 14 year olds. The follow up to a show I enjoyed as a kid. Might not be for me anymore. And. And I'd find that very sad. 
Yeah, I'll check out probably the first couple episodes at least of X Men ninety seven. But I'm I'm like a bit apprehensive because I I would I would love to love the new X Men show, but if I watch it and go, oh, this is um, skewing a bit young for me. This this isn't targeting me. Ah well. The creators for the new toys made sure to focus on her same attributes. <laughs> oh, golly gosh. Um, yep. So, um, in January, I watched a cartoon or animated film called Bell. I forget what its Japanese name is, but uh, it's a very loose adaptation of Beauty and the Beast. It's uh, a bit of a musical... Um, <clears throat> it's kind of a Ready Player One kind of a setting. Uh, I didn't like it, which is kind of surprising. It's like, it's animated, it's a musical, and you don't like it? Yeah, uh, in January I watched it for about half an hour, and then I realized I was just kind of bored, so I stopped. I finally got back to that uh, last weekend or earlier this week whenever I watched it. <laughs> finally watched uh, watched the whole thing. Um, there's a lot I like about it. But um, overall it didn't work for me. And that's, that's a big old darn bummer. Because um, there are a bunch of moments in, in the movie that, that really sing. Sometimes literally. Uh, but I found the overall flow and construction of the film messy and disjointed. I found the um, the other world, the fake world, while visually, simultaneously, occasionally visually interesting and colorful and fun to look at, incoherent and lacking in thought like the whole thing doesn't make really any sense and because of the way the uh, the 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 narrative works you really need to understand how this thing functions otherwise it's hard to get invested in it. at least it was for me um the characters are kind of hit and miss the story structure is particularly in the first third kind of awkward and confusing um yeah it it wasn't for me yeah that's a it's a bummer delicious in dungeon is great i watched the first two episodes and i didn't care for it uh, i talked about this on an earlier podcast um and keep in mind i only saw the first two episodes but why the show's first two episodes didn't work for me is because uh, I like the I like the um, the concept. The conceit is funny. Uh, we have dungeon Dungeons and Dragons dungeon explorers who are exploring dungeons with very few funds. They don't have enough funds. Uh, a party member has been is being held in the well the stomach of a dragon on the ninth floor of the dungeon, so they need to get down there and rescue her. Hopefully it digests very slow. Um, hopefully it's got a lot of breathable air in its stomach too. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so they're, they're, they don't have the funds to buy enough food to get themselves back down there to rescue their companion. So they're like, what if we ate our way down there? What if we ate all the monsters <laughs> that, that we had to fight on our way down? That way we don't need to buy food. We'll just eat our way down. Like, that's, that's a really good idea for a show. That's, that's funny. I like that. Here's one of the ways it, one of the ways it loses me is because it, it doesn't, in the first two episodes anyway, explain the stakes. No pun intended. Like I'd alluded to, is the gal who's in the stomach of the dragon, how much time she got? How much of a time crunch are we in? What happens when you die? Because they, they allude to you can die and you just respawn. So 
who cares? Just wait for her to respawn? Or is it a matter of she's like being slowly digested and no one wants to put up with that? But if that's the case, they also really do not seem to be in any semblance of a hurry. Like, is the most leisurely, again, just first two episodes. Um, so that I wasn't working for me. The other thing that wasn't working for me is the food. Because it's all made up. It's not interesting. Because, oh, look, if, if a slimes, which is a completely made up creature, have these properties. If you dry them out in this particular way and season them with this made up herb, then it's like, great. To me, that is completely uninteresting because all of that is made up. You know, the thing that works about a lot of uh, the fun cooking shows, like uh, Shoko Geki no Soma and others like that, are they're based on real food and real cooking techniques. You know, this is stuff that actually, for the most part, works, which makes it interesting. Or if you watch any of the, um, I don't know, the, the isekai farming animes uh, where, you know, they're farming life in another world or whatever the hell it's called uh they actually go into you know wilderness survival type of stuff um that's interesting D delicious and dungeon to me again only seen the first two episodes doesn't work because all of the ingredients and monsters are completely fictional so all of the ingredients all of the cooking techniques is just manufactured it's just made up so to, to me it's completely uninteresting a lot of it, it's well animated a lot of the humor lands i mean it's not a bad show by any stretch it just doesn't didn't work the first two episodes just didn't work for me uh they can respond her but they got to get to the they got to get to the body first oh okay something they may have considered mentioning in the first two episodes you know so i'm not sitting there thinking like what's the the time frame because again you guys don't seem to be in any hurry here which kind of makes all the characters seem just really callous it's like do, do we care i mean if the characters genuinely do not give the slightest darn about some poor woman being digested by a dragon why should I? They don't seem to be very bothered by it, so... I don't know. The show just wasn't working for me. Which is a shame, because I really like the concept. Uh, anyway. So I watched a movie called um, Baby Assassins. Uh, which is something I saw a trailer for... Some time ago. It came out a couple years ago. Saw the trailer. Um, it's basically Clerks. Uh, uh, Kevin Smith's Clerks. So imagine Dante and Randall. Slacker extraordinaires. But they're assassins instead of convenience store clerks. That's essentially what this movie is. Um... I actually remembered its existence because its sequel is coming out, I think, next month. And I saw the trailer for it. I was like, oh yeah, I remember that. I, sh I still need to watch the first one. I watched the first one and, um, oh boy, this movie strikes me as a very polarizing one. I definitely feel that this is a movie that, for many people, it's just going to bore or annoy. But it really worked for me. Um, I thought the movie did uh, a surprisingly excellent job of uh, setup and payoff. Um, it, because a lot of things pay off and you're like, oh man, I, I didn't even realize that was a setup. Huh, neat. Um, uh, the performances are good. The uh, What action is in it is actually pretty darn well done. Uh, most of the blood is digital, but... Oh well. Um... You run into a similar issue with Delicious in Dungeons, like, how seriously should I take this because of our slacker leads? No one seems to really 
care much about anything. They're just, they just kind of want to sit at home and read manga. They, 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 they just don't, re they're very unmotivated and don't really want to work. Um, but the movie does inject a few um, strategic scenes of genuine tension, which allows the film to say, there are actually stakes here. But it is mostly just a comedy, so you don't worry about it too much. Uh, overall, I, I, I really enjoyed it. it the, the, uh, one of the, the final encounter between uh, the woman with the blonde hair and the guy she fights, really well done fight scene. It's, it's uh, shot very well. It's uh, uh, inventively choreographed. It's well performed. Um, it actually engages in storytelling and character beats rather than just two people punching each other. And um, you actually, or at least I, was like, oh man, she's, she's going to die. Uh, this was a fight where the hits, you feel them. You're like, ow, that, that, oh, she's getting hurt. And um, it, it, works really really well um so the movie is essentially um two slacker assassins versus a particularly progressive yakuza group <laughs> who's uh uh try trying very hard to be progressive not being entirely successful at it either um they're they're trying to expand into um uh women's markets so they uh, they they end up uh, visiting a, a maid cafe. And, you know these big, mean-looking, gruff yakuza are in, are in a maid cafe with the the women in you know the frilly maid outfits and the cat ears and going nya at everything and drawing fun things on their omu rice. And these two gangsters are in their being like, I, I kind of hate this. <laughs> and you're sitting there wondering, it's like, are they just going to murder everybody in there? Or are they going to... It's, uh, they, they actually end up milking some tension out of that scene. It's pretty funny. Uh, there's a pretty great scene to give you a sense of some of the humor. Um, our protagonists, the assassins, they end up offing a drug dealer or someone uh, who was working for the uh, Yakuza. And they're like, oh, shoot, you know, some, someone hired a hitman to assassins to kill our dude. Um, you, 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 daughter, this is totally not nepotism, but my daughter is going to, uh, um, she's going to root out the person who hired the uh, assassins who killed our drug supplier guy. And so later in the movie, uh, there's this dude walking down the street, van pulls up. And the gal and her heavy yank him into the back of the van and start beating the snot out of him. It's like, we know you did it. We know you hired the assassin. Who are the assassins? And he admits it. And he's like, I don't know who they are. I went through an intermediary, blah, 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 blah. blah. He spills his guts. And he's like, how did you find me? And she says, oh, we, we, we were just grabbing people at random. We made a list of who it could possibly be. And you were the, you're literally the seventh try. So, yay! It's, it's like... Okay, that 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 I found really funny. They just brute forced their way. They just grabbed everybody and start start beating the hell out of them until someone confessed. That that uh, I found that pretty funny. This is definitely not a movie for everybody. Again, as I said up top, I I think many people would find this movie annoying and boring. Uh, but it really worked for me. I I thought it was a lot of fun. So, baby assassins, lyrically see hello. Um, <clears throat> speaking of a uh, film that's definitely not going to be for everyone, um, I can have an odd sense of humor. There are seven people on Earth who like the movie Kung Pao Enter the Fist. I'm one of them. Not a great track record if only seven people like your movie, but, you know, I'm one of them, so hey. Um... 
I watched another movie uh, last night, night before, whenever it was. Time doesn't mean anything to me anymore. Uh, that I've actually wanted. To, it came out, I think, in uh, 2001. I've wanted to see it since I heard of it. Never got around to seeing it. Uh, finally found it on a streaming service I have access to. Watched it. And it's called The Lost Skeleton of Cadavera. And it is a um, very goofy... Like Kung Pao Enter the Fist, it's a very goofy comedy using all the trappings of Kung Fu movies, uh, particularly like from the 70s. Uh, Lost Skeleton of Cadaver is exactly the same thing. It is a incredibly silly comedy, but using the trappings of independent uh, sci-fi films from the 50s. Um, watching this movie, Lost Skeleton of Cadaver, I came away from it thinking, not everyone's going to like this movie. I think a lot of people are going to find this movie really stupid. Um, I thought it was hilarious. It, it really... Oh, lyrically, see, you, you love that? Which one do you love? The Skeleton of Cadaver, Lost Skeleton of Cadaver, or Kung Pao Entered Enter the Fist? Are you, are you one of the seven? <laughs> um, <clears throat> Chicago says, I wish they'd show all the ones that didn't confess to doing it. Uh, in Baby Assassins? Maybe in a flashback that would have worked, but... The fact that uh, he's like, how did you find me? It's like, oh, we just kept grabbing people until we found you. You're the seventh. Um, is just a really great reveal and very funny. So it would kind of, ru it would ruin that joke if they showed what she was doing beforehand. But, you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious how she handled the six previous. Um... Kung Pao? Yeah, I, I, I think Kung Pao's hilarious. Uh, I also think The Lost Skeleton of Cadaver is hilarious. Uh, some people might watch that movie and think, but it's one joke. Just done over and over for 90 minutes. And fair, but it's a funny joke. I mean, it's kind of like if, if you go to a piano concert and someone plays variations on a theme, the same theme for the entire concert, be like, what, what are we doing here? But if it's like a really good piece to begin with, <laughs> you know, that's like, okay. Um, so, uh, Lost Skeleton of Cadaver is, uh, you know, you have Science Man and his wife going to study a radioactive meteor. Um, and then you have the, uh, the aliens from Mars or wherever they're from who are also trying to find the meteor. But they, their, their pet mutant escaped and is, you know eating cows and the forest ranger and um then there's a, a, another scientist who's there who's trying to find the radioactive meteorite so that he can resurrect a skeleton the titular lost skeleton of cadaver for some reason and um one of the biggest jokes in the movie is th the intentionally terrible dialogue that doesn't trust you to understand anything at all because it just keeps restating the same things over and over also it's clear that the ostensible writer of this thing wrote it really quickly and didn't really think about what they were doing um because the scientist is just a general scientist he he's like i have to do science this <laughs> he's just doing science and he is going to um make discoveries that improve the field of science like the entire thing not a specific field all of just just science there's there's no individual disciplines it's just all science um so a lot of the dialogue can be uh, is repetitious and that's the joke uh definitely not going to work for everyone there's a the, the aliens have a transmorgification ray or something like that uh, that the scientist is like, oh, I have to sneak into the cabin and get into the good graces of the other scientists and the aliens. This would be easier to do if I had a girlfriend. So I'm going to steal the alien's transmorgification ray and I'm going to shoot a squirrel and turn it into a girl. Uh, actually, he shoots a 
like four different animals and it just combines four different woodland creatures squirrels and a fox or something into a woman and takes the time to teach her english and eating etiquette <laughs> and then drags her to the cabin it's like hi i'm a, a guy let's uh, come in and visit and the uh the the woman animalia or peggy or whatever they end up calling her uh her dialogue for the first part of the movie is rowl um um which is clearly you know something that was written in the script like r-o-w-l um with where the writer was intending it to be a wow you know kind of a guttural animal cry but the actor just literally said rowl and the director either didn't notice or didn't care. <laughs> to me, it's the funniest damn thing. I love it. Um, so, Lost Skeleton of Cadaver. I, I, uh... They could, sh in Baby Assassins, they could show the six previous sitting in a circle after starting a survivor support group. There you go. Yeah, there's, there's ways it could have been done. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know if I could recommend either Baby Assassins or The Lost Skeleton of Cadaver because both movies, I think, are um, aiming at very specific senses of humor and taste. And while they hit mine dead center, I can't guarantee they'll hit yours. But uh, if I made it sound interesting, uh, you know, let me know what you think. I also saw um, Pearl, which is the follow-up to the previous movie, which was called, I think it's just called X, uh, which is a movie uh, about a bunch of kids who rent a barn uh, to film a porno, and they are stalked and killed by a sexually frustrated octogenarian. Yep. So that had a sequel. It's called Pearl. And it's about um, the sexually frustrated octogenarian in her younger days. And uh, I actually like this movie better, even though it's far less gory. Uh, the first movie has a lot of fun gore gags. This one, not so much, but it's, for me, was a much more interesting movie. A um, lot of meaty character stuff. Like, you like dramatic, long monologues? Mwah! This movie is for you. It's got at least two of them, and they're both really good. Um, well performed, too. Uh, <clears throat> you like just really weird stuff? There's a scene where Pearl sexually assaults a scarecrow. So so there's never seen that in a movie before. So um I I don't know if I'd want to you know tongue kiss and grind on something made of hay. That that seems itchy to me, but uh you know everyone's got their kinks, I suppose. Um and uh i this is the first movie i've seen what, what's his name david corn sweat <laughs> something like that the guy who's playing superman in the uh, superman legacy movie uh i was like oh that that's what the dude looks like okay cool because i i when the casting was announced i'm like i have no idea who that is i'm like oh that's who that is all right so uh yeah less of a um more of a psychological horror slash thriller than a slasher slash slasher slashy movie um so uh, tonally a little bit different than the first oh there there's a full musical number in it too and i love me my musicals so uh yeah this 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 movie made me happy i i quite enjoyed it also it uh oh it, interestingly both um baby assassins and um pearl end the same way or 
Both movies, not to spoil any, I'm not going to spoil exactly what happens, but both movies, uh, the credits do not play over black. At least the first half of the credits do not play over black. They're playing over something. I'm not going to spoil what that is, but both movies kind of have the same ending, which I thought was really interesting. Um, Pearl, subtitled An Extraordinary Origin Story, a prequel to X. Oh, okay, there you go. Snake! Hello. What'd you miss? Oh, I've been talking about movies and video game demos. Uh, let's see. And lastly, what I'd like to talk about. Oh, and Snake, if you, if, if you didn't see my uh, thousand tweet long thread about uh, Rogue's Butt and the X-Men animated series, you, you should you should definitely see it because I worked hard on it. I spent hours tweeting about Rogue's Butt. <laughs> and everyone should enjoy it. Uh, uh, so the last thing I'd like to talk about is the fact that I generally do not like sitcoms. I'm talking about the... Um, flat lit usually single location multi-camera setup sitcom the 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 kind of thing that uh, WandaVision was uh riffing on right uh everything from uh you know all in the family married with children um full house you, you know the, those type of situation comedies i don't like them i never have I'm weird. I like Baby Assassins and The Lost Skeleton of Cadavra. <laughs> but I don't like sitcoms. I don't know if it's um, The Artifice. I don't know if it's Laugh Tracks. Not all of them have Laugh Tracks. I don't know if it's the absurd, contrived situations that the characters keep falling face first into. I don't know if it's the fact that so many of these shows, if you take them seriously or if you stop and think about what these characters are actually doing, they're just genuinely terrible people. Like, usually the main characters of these shows are just really snotty, awful, mean people. I'm like, I don't like these people and I don't find the jokes funny. I don't like sitcoms. Um, I can appreciate them. Um, but I just, I don't think there's a single sitcom of that particular style that I like. I don't think there's one. I might be forgetting something. Maybe there's one that actually works for me, but, uh, yeah. Uh, don't, don't. We were denied ass and <laughs> Um... Scroll up in the uh, chat. You'll you'll find a link to it. Uh, it's uh, talking about Rogue's butt, not mine. Although, uh, th also on my Twitter, for, for some reason, Amazon's algorithm decided that, you know, you... Andrew, we've we've looked at your um, your order history. Mm hmm. Yeah. We think something you might want to buy are some flared leggings. I don't know what I bought that would make the Amazon algorithm think that flared leggings is something that I'd be interested in. But okay. Uh, I didn't realize that... I actually, I've never seen anyone wearing flared leggings. Um, the, the flare being on the, uh, the, the cuff of the pants near the ankle. Uh, so they're almost like bell-bottom leggings. Um... Never heard of them before. Never seen anyone wear them. Didn't know they were a thing. I do now because Amazon recommended them to me. For some reason. They're not flared leggings for men either. They're flared leggings for women. I mean, they're stretchy. I'm sure I could squeeze my ass into them. But uh, I... Hmm. Yeah. Don't know. That Amazon tweet had me dying and confused. <laughs> yeah, I... Uh, 
So, sometimes you get recommended something you're like, I, like if I buy a video game, it recommends other video games. That makes sense. If I buy stuff for my kitchen, it recommends other kitchen stuff. That makes sense. I I don't know what I bought that it thinks I want some flared leggings. Not just leggings, flared leggings. I mean, at least they were black. It got the color right. I mean, if I were going to get some flared leggings, I'd definitely get them in black. So, the algorithm had that much right. Um, anyway, back, back to... Um, uh, sitcoms. Sitcoms. Don't like sitcoms. However, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a uh, show that came out that uh, was... I liked... I apologize for talking in circles. <clears throat> I was kind of nervous going into WandaVision because, like, I don't like sitcoms. And the first, like, two episodes of WandaVision are pretty much just a sitcom just a sitcom with Wanda and Vision and it's really well done and there was a lot of it I liked but I'm like yeah I, I wouldn't watch a show like this I, I more admired the first two episodes for how well they did um, the uh, 50s and 60s era sitcom format I mean, they do a really really nice job with it I'm like you know very good I wouldn't watch this. Um, but that's not what the show ultimately is. Helldivers. Yeah, yeah I've, I think I've seen you playing that on Steam. Uh, anyway, so there's a show called Kevin Can F Himself. Uh, came out a couple of years ago. And the conceit of this show is it's your typical multi-camera living room sitcom where the protagonist is a some obnoxious schlub who the world revolves around because you know it's this show um he gets into you know shenanigans and everything just seems to work his way the neighbors are constantly over visiting you know it's it's that kind of a setup the wife is the uh, butt of all the jokes, constantly rolling her eyes at the dumb schemes that her husband comes up with. That's the uh, that's the general general premise of the the sitcom. What makes this one different <clears throat> is it actually the protagonist is actually the wife, and every time she walks off set. So you have the main living room set where, you know, uh, Kevin, the, the husband, and his neighbor friend Neil, and his father, Gary, whatever, it is, and the neighbor, the other neighbor, uh, Susan. Uh, you know, they're there, and he's like, hey, why don't you, uh, you know, get us a beer, or top up our drinks, or honey, blah, blah, blah. And, oh, she's okay. And she walks out of the uh, living room, but as soon as she's away from Kevin... The entire artifice of that style of programming is dropped. The 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 the, the manner of uh, shooting changes. The the lighting, her hair and makeup completely changes. Um, the laugh track uh, and the bouncy, silly music is completely gone. Uh, every time she's not around Kevin, it's shot like a. Um, like a like a prestige drama um and it's really arresting it it's i very much enjoyed uh, there's two seasons uh, the first season is all that's available on the streaming services i have access to uh and i'd like to see the second season because it's just season two seems like more like the second half of the first season than actually a season two it just kind of stops um but uh it's <coughs> it's really interesting i i genuinely adore the conceit of what are these characters like off camera of these type of sitcoms and <clears throat> you know the wife is frazzled anxious miserable depressed and wants nothing more than to get away from this 
loathsome gaslighting sociopath. Um, one thing I like about the, uh, the the show is it for anyone who I mean this this is very obvious to everyone, but uh, especially at this point, but it shines a bright light on just what a repugnant character Kevin and other uh, those archetypes are. They're, they're just really awful people. As strong as the performances can be, as strong as the comedy writing can be, at the end of the day, if you fall prey to actually think about this seriously, these characters are genuinely terrible human beings. And now I feel bad for laughing with them and rooting for them, you know, because they suck. Bad things should happen to them. They're always trying to take advantage of other people for their own personal gain. And it oftentimes, depending on the show, works. Um, so, um, <clears throat> really enjoyed the show. I would um, also, I'd say less than a third of the show is actually the sitcom -y stuff. And they they do that, uh, like WandaVision, boy, they, they've nailed the whole sitcom -y thing. And particularly the performers who do both that heightened reality and artifice of a multi-camera setup sitcom with laugh tracks and stuff like that. You know, bright, flat lighting and all that. Um, how they can just change on a dime and have have character continuity in both places particularly our lead whatever the hell her name is um susan amy samantha something like that um apparently she's on schitt's creek which is a show that i've never seen but apparently she's very good on that too um but yeah excellent performance from her she she it's it's astounding how she switches gears depending on which format she's in and yet it still feels like exactly the same character um where i feel the show isn't as strong is um well i for me anytime it's just focusing on the uh, the sitcom part because i i hate that stuff and i just, just want it to stop but that's kind of the point <laughs> so um and it's the, the, each episode's like about 40, 45 minutes. So there's, there's only probably 10, 12 minutes of actual sitcom stuff in each episode. So it's, it's not that bad. Uh, but I think um, the show does a pretty good job of tying the B-plots of what's going on in sitcom land with in a way that has a uh, dramatic na dramatic narrative effect on what's actually going on in our A plots. So that's good. Where I feel it's not as strong is it's it, it's not as thematically coherent. Stuff that happens in the sitcom world it, it, you know affects what happens outside of it. But there's not a um as often an actual thematic link. It's not like what's happening on set is really coloring our understanding of uh, characters' behavior and emotions and stuff like that. And I and that's really, really hard to do. But, boy, if it did that, th this show would be an all-timer. And instead, I, I just really enjoyed it. I, I don't think it's, like, perfect. I think it's I think it's worth probably watching an episode or two of just to just to see some really great performances and uh, um, the, the, the fun conceit of the show. Um, but overall, I really liked it. Uh, the, the other thing is um, the contrast between the sitcom land and everything where Kevin isn't currently. The contrast is a bit too extreme. I think they go a little bit too far. Um, because when Kevin's there, all the lights are on. Everything's bright and colorful and vibrant, oversaturated and flat lit, as in there's there's no shadows, there's no contrast, right? Um, but as soon as uh, Samantha, or whatever her name is, walks out of the room, or Kevin walks out of the room, 
stuff can be shot from any angle, you know, high angles, low angles, you know, looking at the front, the other end of the end of the living room that the couch is actually facing, right? Um, the lighting's different. You know, every time she, she's in Kevin land, her hair has a lot more volume and her makeup is on. But every time Kevin leaves, you know, her hair's just kind of flat and hanging and, you know, her makeup's different. And the lighting is gray and dark and they do that a little bit too much it's for me it's just the lighting because a lot of the times i'll be watching this show i'm like would you people turn on the goddamn lights why are you sitting in the living room in the dark turn on the lights like i feel between the performances the hair and makeup the uh <clears throat> Uh, the, the, the music track or lack thereof, the, uh, the, the, the different way of filming it, I don't think they needed to go that far with the lighting. You've got plenty of contrast. Now it's just too dark. But overall, I really quite enjoyed um, that first season and I uh, hope the second season ends up on a, a service that I can watch. Um... Next thing on my uh, to watch list is uh, I forget what it's called. Uh, something about a gun shop. Let me let me see if I can find it real quick. Uh, it's on Hulu. Um, a shop for killers. Um, I saw a trailer for that and I was like, oh, that looks neat. And uh, apparently, uh, some gal is raised by her uncle. And so she inherits his gun shop, and but then I guess he's got treasure in his basement, so bad guys try to take it from her, but she was trained by her uncle, so she so I guess we assault on Precinct 13 it here, with her shooting everybody who's trying to take her gun shop. I'm like, okay, that looks fun. Apparently it's a TV series, an episodic show. Again, I... I've mentioned this many times before, but I cannot tell the difference between... When I watch a trailer, I apparently cannot tell the difference between a movie and a series. Because I thought this was a movie. It's a series. Several times I'll watch trailers and I'll go like, Oh, I'm going to watch that show. It turns out to be a movie. Or I'll watch a trailer and I'll go, Oh, I'm going to watch that movie. It turns out to be a show. I, I, I don't know if trailers are getting bad at this or if I'm getting bad at this. No adder. Oh, and a new Ghostbusters movie comes out next month. So, this is WandaVision? No, I'm, I'm not talking about WandaVision. I'm, I'm talking about a, a show called Kevin Can F Himself. Um, and uh, the official title does appear to be F asterisk asterisk K, rather than spelled out, probably because it aired on AMC or something like that. So, uh Whatever. Can't print that in TV Guide. You remember TV Guide? You remember the publication? The book? The weekly book that was mailed to you that had a listing of every single thing that was on every single channel at every single time for every day for the entire week? You remember that? It's like a phone book for your TV every week. <laughs> I don't do that anymore. Snake says, I am wary of new Ghostbusters. Me too. And Ghostbusters is my favorite thing. Like, the original movie is, the one from 84 is my favorite movie. And, um, yeah, I didn't like Afterlife. I, I was definitely in the minority on that one. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I think Ghostbusters 2 and Ghostbusters 2016 are... Not great, but not terrible. There, there's like a lot to. They don't work, but there's a lot to individ, A lot of individual moments and beats in both of those films that are really very entertaining and very funny. Afterlife, I thought, was genuinely bad. And I'm Frozen Kingdom, Frozen Empire, whatever the new one's called. <sighs> Looking at the trailer, the, the, one of the biggest issues I had with Afterlife was it seemed so unbelievably scared to not be the original Ghostbusters, which was a shame because 
the original stuff in the movie was actually quite good. But I mean, it. They're like, no, no, no. We we've got the original cast. Whether it makes sense for them to be here or not. And look, it's it's Gozer and it's it's Stay Puffed and it's Zool and and she's wearing the same dress for some reason. Cause you recognize that dress from the movie, right? Love us, please love us. We're Ghostbusters. You love Ghostbusters, and we're Ghostbusters, so you should love us. It's it's pathetic. It's 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 cloying and it's sad and it I don't like it. Um, even the the film score was pissing me off because all the original music was actually really good, but then when they used um, uh, tracks from the original uh, film. A lot of them were just used in the wrong spot. I'm like, that's not where you use that track. That's incorrect. You don't understand what you're doing. You're just grabbing a popular piece of music and dropping it on a scene because it's Ghostbusters. I think the best example of that is from a completely different movie, but from the uh, Robocop remake from like, I don't know, 2007, somewhere in there, whenever it was. Um... Where you have the Robocop thing, da 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 um, And they blast the Robocop theme on Alex Murphy's introduction. What are you doing? What are you doing? That's not Robocop. He's not Robocop yet. We actually don't even know who that is because he's shot from behind. It turns out that that's Alex Murphy, but that's like... No, that's that's incorrect. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about, where a lot of the uh, the the tracks from the original Ghostbusters, from Elmer Bernstein's score, is just kind of seemingly dropped in there at random. It's like, no, that's not where that goes. So those were some of the big problems I had with the Afterlife, and looking at the trailers for Frozen Kingdom, Frozen Empire, whatever it's called, um, it looks like it's falling prey to the same stuff. Um, look, it's, we got the, the, the mini Stay Puffs again, because you love those. D did we, though? Why would they be there? D does that make any sense? Maybe it does. Maybe there's a good explanation for it, or maybe it's just, like, because they're cute. Slimer's there. Janine's there, and she's a Ghostbuster now. Okay? All the Ghostbusters, all the surviving Ghostbusters are there. And Walter Peck is there. I, everybody who's alive is there. Please, it's Ghostbusters. You love Ghostbusters and we're Ghostbusters. Please love us. It's like, that's what it feels like it's going to be again. And I, I don't like that. It's like, look. Make some cool ghosts and have people shoot lasers at them. You, you know, that that's... There's a bunch of different ways you could do Ghostbusters, right? You can do workplace comedy. You can do action adventure. You know, there's no one right way to do Ghostbusters. I mean, you do kind of need ghosts and someone to bust them. I mean, otherwise it's probably not Ghostbusters. But I realize the first one is the best one, but... Christ Almighty! Just, just make another movie. You know, stop, uh, stop rehashing everything from the first movie. I love the first movie. I have it on DVD. I've seen it a bunch of times throughout my decades. Um, oh, hey, it's the 40th anniversary of that film. It came out in the spring of '84. Um. But I hope I'm wrong. Uh, maybe that's just the marketing. Maybe the marketing is just jam-packing the trailers with uh, every recognizable Ghostbusters thing that they could find, and the movie's genuinely great. I hope so. Because I don't like not liking Ghostbusters. I don't like not liking anything, but I definitely do not like not liking Ghostbusters. That makes me sad. And when I'm sad, I pout. And no one wants to see a 44-year-old person pouting. <laughs> um, 
The snake says, I still get phone books mailed to me. Do you? Wow. Chicago remembers the TV guide. We don't talk about female Ghostbusters. I talk about female Ghostbusters because that movie has some good stuff in it. Uh, it doesn't work as a film. Like, I remember um, I was so excited to see the movie New Ghostbusters. We went to see it. And uh, I think my dad called me uh, like the next day. He's like, so, uh, so how was the movie? And I was like, he's like, you know, uh, out of how many stars out of five? I'm like, two, <laughs> you know, it's not a very good movie. There's a lot I liked about it, but yeah, as a film, it just doesn't work. I do like the characters though. I wouldn't mind seeing those characters again. Um, those characters have showed up in some of the IDW comics, and they're they're great. Janine's actually in the uh, the the I actually love how they. Um, it's interesting how uh, all of the Ghostbusters stuff from the original movie and even the the real Ghostbusters cartoon is in the IDW stuff, uh, even some of the Extreme Ghostbusters stuff, but. For the IDW comics, at least the ones I've read, it doesn't come across as cloying, right? It, it doesn't come across as so afraid to do anything other than repeat the first movie. It's just, we're going to add all kinds of stuff in there because it's fun. So, it's like Slimer being in the movie isn't in and of itself a problem. Slimer's fine, you know? Uh, the original Ghostbusters still being alive and kicking and being in the movie is fine. That in and of itself is not a problem. For me, the problem is, is if, this if all of those elements are being used as a crutch because you've got nothing else. Right? The IDW books, the comic books, they're like... Hey, wouldn't it be neat if we grabbed this element from the cartoon or the movie or the other movie and brought it in here and did something interesting with it? Sure. Rather than, oh, how can we sell this? Well, that sold. Get that and pile stuff on top of it. But not in a way that you can't see what it's... Yeah. Well, I hope the new Ghostbuster. I'll go see it. It's Ghostbusters. Of course I will. But uh, hope it's good. Um, uh, Avgadon said it the best way. If it's going to be bad, why give it money? Well, because you don't know if it's going to be bad until you see it. I mean, you can you can watch the mar you can look at the marketing and your confidence can increase towards it being good or bad. Sure, you yeah. know. I look at marketing, I go, that looks like that's going to be pretty good. I look at other marketing, I say, that looks like it's going to be pretty crap. And a lot of times I'm right, and sometimes I'm wrong. So, I think, it, you know, I mean, if something looks like crap, yeah, don't go see it. <laughs> you know? Um, if you're a huge fan of Ghostbusters, I, as I am, I'm going to see anything that has Ghostbusters on it. Even if it looks crap. And... Frozen Empire, I think it's Empire. Frozen Empire doesn't look crap. I'm just seeing a lot of red flags in the marketing. There's a lot of cool stuff in the trailer. But there's a lot of stuff that's going like, oh man, that looks like they might be doing this thing that I don't like. On the other hand, a lot of people really liked Afterlife. So, you know, just one dude's opinion. It's like that desperate, needy guy trying to get a date. Well, uh, Lewis. <laughs> Most modern movies are just soulless cash grabs. Mm. Well, I, I mean, certainly ones that come, you know, the, the, the higher budgeted studio projects. Um, I like to think that for the most part, the people that actually make the movies are invested in making a good movie and try their best. Sometimes they fail. Sometimes they're, uh, they can't succeed because of 
you know, interference. I think the soulless cash grabby part is, you know, studio and producer stuff, right? Like, take uh, Warner Brothers, take David Zasloff. Please take David Zasloff. Get get him out of the industry. Uh, this That is soulless cash grabbing. That guy does not care about film or art. All he cares about is money, and he's really bad at his job anyway. Um... So yeah, there there are a lot of people involved in well all art that makes money who don't care about art, they care about money. Which again, it's not which did I said the first time. Well, to be clear, money is not unimportant. You know. If you make art, great. If your living is dependent on your art, and you want to make more art, well, your art better be appealing to someone, <laughs> right? Um, you know, this stuff does have to make money or there's not going to be any more of it. So there, there definitely needs to be folks in the process somewhere who are focusing on the financials. That's true. But to an extent, in some projects, yeah, it's just like, um, you know, we can we can even go uh, smaller. Uh, when Winnie the Pooh became public domain, and uh, when a version of Mickey Mouse just became public domain, uh, some very cynical people uh, just said, you know what's the cheapest, easiest thing to shoot? Horror. Because you throw blood at stuff and Andrew's going to watch it even if it's really bad. And they're not wrong. So they made Pooh, Blood, and Honey and whatever the Mickey Mouse horror film is. And there's, there's a couple of them. Because it's like, haha, it's free to use and we can cash in on a moment. That's soulless. That's a cash grab. But there were... There might, in some of these projects, have been people like who wrote the thing or who directed it, who were genuinely trying to do something, at least within constraints, do something artistic, something interesting, something that says something. Even if it's just, this is fun, let's let's do a fun thing with a um, long-beloved IP, something, you know, radically different. But a lot of them, yeah, it, it's just, uh, aha, opportunity, strike, strike that opportunity. Punch it in the mouth. Movie industry is just like the video game industry. Broadly, yeah. Yeah. I have not... I'm yet to come aware of any game projects that have been written off for a tax break. I mean, there's definitely been projects that have been shelved. But I haven't, I haven't heard of one that was like, we can make more money just throwing this away than, um, than we can actually just selling it. Um, like we're seeing with Warner Brothers and them, uh, you know, just scrapping completely, you know, completely or nearly finished movies for tax write-offs. Of course, the easy answer to that, well, easy answer to that is like, change the law so corporations can't do that. Because it's, bad for art it's bad for uh people who make art people who consume art it's terrible for everyone who worked really hard for years on any of these projects even if they ultimately turn out to be bad right even bad movies people worked hard on i mean there were probably some people who were slumming it sure but you know, I when I approach uh, media, I always try to remember that um, there's a lot of people involved. Some of them probably suck. Some of them probably didn't care. And it's probably mostly the money people. Um, and, you know, sometimes you get actors, directors, and other people who are just, they're just cashing a paycheck, don't care. But there are so many people who work on... Um, movies, video games, these really large projects, that it's likely that 
a non-zero number of people genuinely did care and tried their best to make something worthwhile. I always try to keep that in mind. So it's why I'm rare, at least I try not to be... I will make no bones, as I talked about how I didn't like Afterlife, I make no bones about uh, any film or song or video game or whatever that I don't like. But I always try not to be mean to the people who made it, right? I'm like, you know, you, you made a bad movie. It's okay. Making movies is hard. Doesn't mean you're a bad person for making a bad movie. Doesn't mean you intended to make a bad movie. So when I, when I hit it, hit films and stuff that I don't like, I always try to keep that in mind that, you know, real people with feelings and stuff worked on this and probably worked really hard on it. And they probably would even grudgingly acknowledge some of your critiques. Still stings, I imagine. So I, I, I try not to, you know, critique art in a way that is m unduly mean to the artist, right? I try anyway. I, I'm sure some of the stuff I've said comes off as pretty mean, but I do try. Um, Oh, angry video. Uh, James Rolf, I think his name is. He's still around. Cool. Uh, I yeah, I've heard of the angry video game Ned. He's still doing that shtick. Yeah, if it's still working for him, good on him. Uh, let's see. Chicago says I haven't seen Afterlife. I heard it got a decent review. That doesn't always mean much. I, I mean, yeah, uh, I didn't like it, but I know a lot of people who really, really did. Oh man, I was I was so depressed. I saw it in the drive-in. And the drive-in's like thirty minutes away. Um, boy, that that th driving home at like one in the morning, seeing the new Ghostbusters movie and really not liking it. Oh man, that sucked. I was. What did I see that on a double feature with? I'm trying to think of what I saw it with. I think it was another movie that I didn't care for. I might have saw it with Venom or something like that. <laughs> um, I don't remember what I double featured it with. It was whatever was playing uh, against it at the drive-in, but... Uh, yeah. Hmm. Change the law. Well, Snake is very cynical and... Understandably so. Oh, he, uh, James uh, Rolf is focusing on board games and movies. Okay. Well, he's a he's a filmmaker, so that that makes sense. He's he's always been a uh, not huge in, in into his stuff, but uh, I, I've I've seen some of the AVGN. Uh, I was more interested in his. Um, film reviews and like monster madness and stuff that he used to do or maybe still does it um uh, because there there was uh there uh, he at least projected a, a genuine interest and passion uh for film that 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 seemed to be more his love than video games but uh yeah yeah good on him for uh hope he's hope he's doing well and well, i hope he didn't hope he's not like a horrible asshole today i know a lot of people that uh you and I and others, you know, enjoyed in the early days of the internet are not very good people now. So hopefully James is a cool dude. Um, he might retire and I won't blame him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he's been doing it for like what fifteen years. Um, you grew up watching James and me. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, you're twenty five. Okay. Yeah. So I've been doing that. Okay, so you've been watching uh, our stuff since you were a teenager. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, hopefully I never become a crotchety old guy who doesn't can't stand the things that the kids are into today. Ah, TikTok is poisoning the minds of the youth. 
it should be banned or something, you know. Uh, PSVR is going to rot your brains, you know. Uh, of course, I'm only in my 40s, so uh, maybe I have to get older before I start doing that shit, but yeah. So far, uh, technology hasn't passed me by. So far, there's nothing out there that is like, oh, I don't understand this new technology. It scares me. It must be harmful to children, so it needs to be restricted. This thing that I don't use and have never interacted with and don't understand at all. So far, I'm only 44, but so far I'm not doing that. So, <laughs> so <laughs> good on me thus far. Um, Lindy says, I think it's a bit too late for that, Andrew. You old man yelling all the time, you. Yeah. Mr. Lee got arrested by feds? Who is Mr. Lee? I, I don't know who that is. You know, one of the videos I'm, I'm thinking about doing is, um, I'm a musician, and, uh, as you might expect, I listen to a fair amount of music, and, uh, I do troll YouTube, um, uh, listening to different, uh, performers, and, uh, stuff and I was thinking about doing a music uh, a video just highlighting you know five YouTube musicians who I think are neat of course that runs into issues of can I show parts of like what they do without them yelling at me or yeah or you know I can try contacting them and act ask them permission but a lot of times you don't hear back and it's like eh. It, you know, it's, it's tough. Could just talk about it on a podcast at some point, but, uh... Hmm. Oh, Leland Yee. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, is that who you were talking about? Sure. Jesus, yeah. Um, I don't think he's in... He got out of prison by now, right? But, yeah, that... that for those of you who don't remember, back in... Back in like 2005 to 2010, back in the heydays of game politics, uh, Leland Yee was a, a California state senator who was one of the um, national politicians who was on the video games are actively harmful uh, to children uh, in the sense that playing violent video games makes young people people who play them act out violently uh, and other things. So he was constantly championing uh, um, legislation that was repeatedly found to be unconstitutional that would restrict the sales of violent video games to children who weren't buying violent video games in the first place, so that would have been pretty ineffective. Uh, I did a video a while back called um, Postal to... I think it's called Postal to a Pacifist's Game, something like that. I can probably look it up real quick. Uh, yeah, Postal to a Pacifist's Game. Oh, look how young I am. Uh, yeah, did that ten years ago. Here we go. Uh, so this is, uh, this goes through, uh, the, the California, well, at least one of the California legislations, and while, uh, the, the, the conceit of the video is Postal 2 was one of the go-to, this game will rot your brain, even though the game at the time was really old. Um, so, uh, I am playing Postal 2 while talking about the um, the California law and why it fails in every conceivable way. So I'm, I'm actually quite proud of that video. So uh, give it a watch if you've never seen it, uh, if you like. Uh, but yeah, Leland Yee, um, so he was one of those anti-video game legislation championing guys. And he was a crook. Like, he was in with the Mafia. Like, have you seen the movie American Hustle? It's like exactly that. 
And uh, yeah, he uh, went to uh, prison on RICO charges. So, uh, you know, racketeering. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, hmm. And Jack Thompson, of course, uh, was famously uh, disbarred. And golly, you know how hard you have to suck to get disbarred. And he got disbarred for being dishonest he got he got disbarred for lying this lawyer lied so much and so flagrantly that he got fired he got disbarred for lying that lawyers almost never you have to you almost have to literally murder people to get disbarred as a lawyer it's uh, there's you, you you'd think the various bars would have the higher bars to clear. Right? Like, me, I'm the kind of guy that's, I mean, maybe, the, I guess the lawyers that, you know, that they're, they're working for them just bring in too much money. I, maybe it's something like that, but it's like, if I had people representing me, I'd be like, this is a shitty person who makes me look bad. No, you can't. Go away. Right? Uh. Ah, those were the days. Here at the postal too, yeah. I um, Vince, uh, what's his name from Running with Scissors? Um, actually met Vince and a few of the other Running with Scissors folks at E3 in 2006. Uh, they saw that video and they they're like, "Hey, you want to code for Postal 3? <laughs> I'm like, "Sure." <laughs> um, Leland Yee was the real Grand Theft Auto. Yeah, he 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 was a um, he was a scumbag. I mean, he was a he was a a fraud and a criminal, and also wrong about video games. I mean, it is true if um, you know violent media, video games, movies, books, whatever. If that's the only form of input you have growing up, yeah, yeah, you're gonna have a skewed outlook on life. But that's not the fault of the media you're consuming. Like if you've ever seen Short Circuit, you know, input Johnny Five needs input, and he goes to a bookstore uh, and just reads every as much as he can in a bookstore, and he he just absorbs all the data around him uh he becomes who he is uh partially because of the data he absorbs but also because of the ali sheedy and steve gutenberg you know explaining the concepts of death and life and friendship and violence and happiness and all of the stuff that's hard to pick up from books because otherwise Johnny Five might have been like uh, Johnny's four, three, two, and one, just a robot with a laser that shoots things and blows them up. So, man, short circuit. I haven't thought about that film in a while. And rejoice, the entire internet. Left. Yeah, I remember the um, video I did probably a decade ago it's like uh, the 20 dumbest things people say about video games i remember when i was writing that i made a concerted effort to um and i thought maybe i'd do a follow-up to that but really the dumb things people say or have said about video games it's the same dumb shit right i actually kept a list subsequent to that video thinking maybe i'd revisit that well at some point but i only ended up with like three or four new things on it because it's just the same dumb shit over and over uh getting 20 unique dumb things people have said about video games was actually quite the challenge and also limiting jack thompson on that list was a challenge like i think he's probably a third of the list uh he's like got six or seven entries but i mean it's hard to avoid because all the dumbest stuff came from him he was one of the most vocal anti-video game people of that era. 
Ah, uh, yeah. Those were the days when he'd constantly post press releases in the comments section of game game politics articles. Like any like format them in the in the style of a press release. I'm like, are you sending these to like news organizations or are you just are you just posting in the comments section of a news blog? <laughs> you doping. But, you know, he'd constantly be uh, posting his little press releases and then all of us would gleefully pick them apart and correct everything he got wrong, which was literally every single line was wrong. He'd make up studies, like the Harvard brain scan study that proved that uh, video, violent video games were harmful. Didn't exist. Literally didn't exist. Finally got him to admit. It took me, it took me a while to... Uh, I always figured he was referring to something. But um, uh, when he... When I finally cornered him and got him to identify something. And it was, uh, it was a study. Wasn't Harvard. Wasn't brain scan. So... Because when I first asked him, he's like, oh, well, if you can't find it, you're an idiot or something like that. It's like, yeah, I, I guess I don't feel too bad about not being able to find the Harvard brain scan study, which, uh, oh, and had nothing to do with video games either. You know, the Harvard video game brain scan study, study that was not done at Harvard, was not funded by Harvard, had nothing to do with brain scans or video games. <laughs> what an asshole. Jack Thompson has so many quotes. He, he does. Uh, remember how he used to always brag about being on 60 Minutes? And then I bought the transcript from that 60 Minutes episode and proved that he, that he was lying about it. <laughs> Because he'd always say, and I was on USA Today the day before talk where I predicted uh, Columbine or, or something, uh, the Paducah shooting, one of them. And so I so I bought both of the transcripts from the, because uh, at that time the, these things were not archived, they were not available. But you could go to a news service and buy the original transcripts of the 60 Minutes and the USA Today or whatever show it was. And I bought those episodes and I reported on them and he was lying just flat out flat out lying didn't think anyone would able uh at the time neither of those episodes were actually on youtube they maybe they are now i don't know but they were not at the time uh but i got the transcript i guess that's why he was comfortable lying about them because he didn't think anyone would be able to find them but he also didn't care yeah uh folks like jack thompson because his ilk is still around today, unfortunately. Uh, they genuinely do not care if you point out that they're lying or that they're hypocrites or that they're wrong. They, they don't care. They're just going to keep saying the thing anyway. It's, it's weird to me, anyway, seeing people who have absolutely no shame, who, um, like you, and I mean, I, in the sense that they cannot be be shamed that you can't shame them you can point out that they're wrong you can point out that they're hypocrites you can point out that they're lying they genuinely don't care they're not moved by that 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 doesn't matter to genuinely genuinely does not matter to them at all you can go ahead and point that stuff out all you like but they don't care and their fans don't either which is weird to me uh it's like they just don't care what's true. And I get the feeling that that's probably the case for most of them. And uh, for a long time, I was like, that can't be it until I actually came across someone I know. Someone from my own life who does not care what's true. Genuinely doesn't care. Lies about it, but genuinely doesn't care. Came to a head at one point. 
said, um, uh, look, here, here are my, here are my two big problems with issue X, right? A and B. These are my, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm against issue X for, because of A and B. I said, okay. If you found out that you were 100% completely wrong about both A and B, would you change your mind about X? Nope. I mean, kudos for admitting it. And then said, oh, but I still want to know. I said, no, you don't. You don't care. And you lied about those A and B being your two big problems because as you just demonstrated, they're not going to affect how you feel about X. So those aren't your two big problems, are they? They don't matter. Because whether they're true or not makes absolutely no difference how you feel about X. So you lied to me. You just flat out lied to me. That was a lie. And then you saying that you cared whether they're true, that was a lie too. You don't care what's true. That, I just can't wrap my head around that. Not caring what's true. I mm, Makes no sense to me. Fox News and Mass Effect. Yeah. I forget what specific. It was, oh, it was, uh, oh, Jesus, there was a Chiron that said, oh, the sex box. <laughs> they were talking about the, the, the really awkward love scenes that you can see in, um, the Mass Effect game. Jesus Christ, I forgot about that. Yeah. Oh God, there was a there was an interview that they brought. Who did they bring in? Who literally had no idea what they were talking about? Had not seen the game. Ah, oh, it's, it's. I mean, to me, that would be embarrassing, right? I mean, that's embarrassing. Being caught pretending to know what you're talking about and being caught exposed, uh, proven that you, not only do you have you don't know what you're talking about, you have no experience with what you're and your and your conclusions are demonstrably wrong. That would be humiliating to me. I mean, that should be hum. I, mm, but no, just don't care. Just genuinely do not care. Doesn't affect him. It's the damnedest thing. I don't get it. Yeah. Oh, well. Well... I think I've yeah been rambling for an extra hour, so um, yeah, I think that's that's enough for tonight. Um, I mean, at least there are good video games and movies and music and books and stuff. You know, there's some good stuff out there. So, And uh, one of the good video games is uh, Trails to Azure, uh, which I'll be playing more of tomorrow uh, on the Sunday stream. So, uh... <laughs> so uh, thanks, uh, everyone, for hanging out. Uh, check out my Rogue's Butt uh, <laughs> thread on Twitter, because <laughs> that, that was a fun way to spend five hours on a Wednesday night. Um, and uh, have a nice night, and uh, hope to see you tomorrow for the stream. So... Take care. Bye-bye.